Hey, Bill, look what I did. What the hell is that? I summoned a demon. He's going to teach me magic. What? Oh, don't worry. He can't leave the circle. I made it with Mrs. Dash. We don't have any real salt since you started that low-sodium diet. That will work. Never mind. It's our class review of the Warlock this week on the Dungeon Master's Dojo. Support the Dungeon Master's Dojo by heading over to Apple Podcasts and Podchaser and leave a review. Take the time to leave a comment as well. This helps make us more searchable to those listeners interested in content such as ours. But more importantly, we want to know how we are doing and what topics you would like to hear about. Another way you can support the DMD is with a small monthly donation so we can continue to deliver quality content to you, our listeners. This also helps us to upgrade and replace equipment. Head over to Anchor to the Dungeon Master's Dojo page and click the support button. And now, on to this week's episode. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Dungeon Masters Dojo Podcast. This is a show for game masters, as well as experienced and new players alike. We hope to bring you the tools needed to not only be a great GM, but to help you develop as a player. I'm your host, Louis Aponte. Our stars of the show are Scott Labby and Bill Robotile. Let's enter the dojo and see what both Bill and Scott have in store for us today. Hey, Bill. Hey, Scott. How's it going? Good. I summoned a demon. Sounded like it. Yeah. Guess we're talking about warlocks this week? We are. And also, kids, at home, Mrs. Dash does not work. Yeah. <laughs> I, so, no. I so wanted to laugh when he said that. I had to stop. I seen you. That's why you got to pre-read these things ahead of time, buddy. It doesn't get you off guard. Yeah, we're, uh, we're doing warlocks. I mean, what better class, really, for a Halloween-themed episode than the warlock? I really enjoy the warlock. We went to 5th Ed. The very first character I made was a warlock, yeah, and I, mean, I, I had a great time with her. Yeah, they start with a, just a couple spell slots, but with all the other stuff, when you do with your patron, you kind of buffs it back up, and uh, she, I think she came off as a fairly imposing character. She, she did. Um, you know, I've been doing more reading lately on the warlock because I'm waiting for Tasha's uh, Cauldron of Everything, and I'm waiting for the Regini warlock to be available, um, so I've been doing a lot more reading, and I'm very interested in just warlocks in general. Now. I know you've been talking about it constantly. You drool every time you do. Yep. Yeah. Warlocks. Warlocks are cool because, well, from a DM's perspective, they already come pretty much with the makings for a pretty interesting campaign. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how do you work that otherworldly patron into things? And what role do they have? Well, that's a huge section of their backstory, whether they wrote one or not. Yeah. It's a huge section of their backstory. And. It's just a giant bucket load of fodder for the GM. And it's it's cool stuff. You know, really, I'll, I'm a huge fan of the backstory, and I ask every everyone who <gasps> plays at my you team, are? I love the backstory. First I've heard of it. Would have never guessed. Yeah, the backstory is great. So take the time to have your players write their backstories, even if it's a series of bullet points. I've had, well, I mean, Tom produces like a five- to ten-page backstory. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I've I've got other other players who just hand me some bullet points written on a napkin, a la a la our sin. <laughs> yeah, he uh, he's a he's the master of the bullet points. Um, I think that was actually in crayon too. But, <laughs> but it's it's great because that's that's stuff you can weave into the story in in the uh, the warlock. I mean, that's that's just that's good stuff. That's it just is. so it is. good. There's a lot of let's say there's a lot of meat to it. Before you even get the, you know, before you can get your backstory, there, there's so much there. Yeah, and and I I feel like they're kind of a long time coming. I mean, granted, they've been with us since third edition, but I think they really should have been in D and D from the very beginning. And I'm surprised it took as long as as it did because we had what we had like a D and D in second and two point five for what yeah, but back, twenty years. Back then, everyone was a mage. Well, yeah. major wizard. Boom, yeah, that's it. Magic users. Yeah, that's it. Boom, done. Probably the lamest term next to fighter. Yeah. Ever. Yeah, I'm I'm glad I'm glad that they're getting kind of like the treatment that they they finally finally deserve. They're like the rock star of spellcasters. You know, <laughs> the the Chris Angels 
you know, <laughs> the front man. Yeah, kind of like the sexy rock star type of thing. Look at me in my leather pants, well, and I, I got a cat too. I think it's because they're very versatile too uh, uh, to go along with that. Yeah, they're um, they they are. They can do a lot of like really really cool stuff. Like I I really dig the uh, the pack magic stuff that they they have at their disposal. And really, with with only those those couple of spell slots, they they they're still they well, still got. Well, some you oomph. delve into the Book of Shadows as well, and now you have all your ritual spells at yeah. your you know advantage. So if you have a little bit of time, you know, ten minutes, okay. But then you have your spells. You're not burning your spell slots. You're still getting your spells. So depending on what you put in that book, it also gives you an, a place to store things from. You can cast it right out of the book as well, but um, it. It helps buffer up those, you know, oh, I only got two spell slots, except for this giant book of things that I have as well. Now, how many patrons uh, is Tasha going to give us? Just just those two that you've you've been mentioning uh, forever? Well, I, I definitely know there's one. It's the, the genie, um, and that's the one I'm, I'm really interested in because... Um, and the only one he's looked at, apparently. Oh, no, I, I looked at the... Um, <laughs> I like that some of the current ones that we have now. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I've been actually playing one in Baldur's Gate as well. That's... Um, the genie patron was a UA for a while, right? Yes, it was. Yeah. They tested yep. and they, they they polished it up. Um, Baldur's Gate is, I mean, I remember the, the 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 old game. Lou says a lot of like really good things about it, so maybe I'll maybe I'll head over to Steam and download it, and we can do like a review of Baldur's Gate. I think you would like it. I it and it would be good for a review as well. Is there an upgrade of Baldur's Gate for my Pong game? <laughs> it's a huge upgrade. <laughs> It's like watching uh, just regular cinematic TV sometimes. But you have to do things? Yes, you yeah. do. All right. Someone's going to have to show me how to do things. Well, well yeah. we will. We'll get the old guy up to speed. That's, that, that's right. <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to get his computer up to speed. He's still got one, one of those digital watches from the future that was back in like 83, you know, with the, a calculator the one on that it. Dick Tracy wore? Yeah, for figuring. <laughs> for figuring. So let's get going. Yes, let's All right, get going. Let's. So here's our disclaimer, guys. This information that we're about to present you is from published material, so there's no Unearthed Arcana material in this episode. We do know that there's some stuff out there being playtested for the Warlock in the UA. We may or may not review that material in the future. We haven't really decided yet. So let's kick it off, Bill. All right, so the Warlock, uh, from then to now, a little bit of history. The Warlock is one of the newest character classes available to Dungeons & Dragons. Up until 3rd edition, there was no such thing as a Warlock character class. The complete Wizard's Handbook from 2nd edition D&D does have a Wizard's Kit called the Witch. And as we all know, a Warlock is a male witch. Um, Here's what it says about the Witch Kit. The Witch is a wizard whose powerful magical abilities are extra planar in origin. The Wizards typically learn the basics of spellcasting at Magic Academies or from learned mentors. Witches learn magical skills from entities and their direct minions from other planes of existence or from other witches. Occasionally, these extraplanar entities contact useful humans or demi-humans for magical instruction. Other times, humans and demi-humans seek out the entities through arcane rituals and petition them for instruction. These entities agree to such instruction for a variety of reasons. Some hope to train their students to eventually become emissaries. Some hope to use them as conduits for various various forces. Some hope to seduce them as consorts, and some simply share their magical secrets for their own amusement. Whatever the motives of the extraplanar entities, they exude a powerful directing influence over their students. However, a few witches with particularly strong wills are able to maintain their own drives while using their magical skills To further their own goals, such witches face a lifelong struggle with the forces who relentlessly strive to direct their spirits. The requirements for becoming a witch are higher than any other kit. Because their training is more demanding than that received by most other wizards, she must have a minimum intelligence or wisdom of 13. To resist a corruption inherent from contact with extraplanar entities, she must have a minimum constitution of 13. The vast majority of witches are female. But male witches are also possible, commonly called warlocks. The witch kit cannot be abandoned. If a witch manages to sever all ties from the entities responsible for their instruction, usually requiring the power of a wish or its equivalent, she loses two experience levels. If she still wishes to pursue a magical career, she must relearn the experience levels that she lost. So this kit does appear to be a predecessor to the third edition Warlock class as much of that description fits with our present idea of what the Warlock is. 
These individuals are contacted by extraplanar entities or they have contacted said entities for the purpose of instruction, learning the spells and knowledge that these extraplanar entities teach. While not a class unto itself, the witch is a wizard's kit. It is an add-on to the wizard character class. Let's go back to third edition. This is when the warlock makes its appearance as a non-core class. These non-core classes are classes that are rare, so you don't see them as often as you would a fighter, wizard, rogue, or whatever. Nonetheless, this is when the warlock becomes official, so to speak. Like their predecessors, the witch, warlocks derive their power from an extraplanar entity through what is called a fell pack, or they are simply born with these abilities, not unlike a sorcerer. In the third edition, the warlock does not cast spells, but uses what is referred to as a spell-like abilities. These spell-like abilities, referred to as invocations, come from the warlock tapping into the powers that given to them through their fell pack, or the power that they are able to channel through themselves. These invocations are at will abilities, and there is no limit on the number of times that the invocation can be cast. When 4th edition comes around, we see some changes in the Warlock class. Their powers are known as spells. We see the Warlock's curse arrive, and almost all of their attack abilities are charisma-based or or constitution. Some abilities do gain bonuses from intelligence. The source of the Warlock's abilities is more clearly defined in 4th edition. These abilities come from what is called a pact. This has traveled with the Warlock class all the way to 5th edition. Pact boons become a thing, and... Six packs were introduced in 4th edition, not to be confused with six packs. I suddenly felt a little pang there. (laughs) Yeah, six... Oh, never mind, wrong one. Many have described 4th edition as a pen and paper version of an MMORPG. And I think this is a fairly accurate description of what the game was during 4th edition. The role that the Warlock played in an adventuring party was not unlike a DPS class in an MMORPG. 5th edition arrives, and here we're back to the present day. The Warlock is a full-blown character class. Uses magic, this magic being a combination of spells and invocations that are granted by whoever the Warlock's patron is. So they have a spell list and they get special abilities, these invocations from whoever their patron happens to be. Yeah, so that's that. In a nutshell, the uh, long and sordid history of the Warlock since the very beginnings, humble beginnings in... 2.5 2.5 edition, I would go as far as to say that's where we probably see the Warlock begin to develop is, is in the that Wizard's Handbook. I would, right. I would agree. Um, you know, like I said, I did since I didn't touch 3 or 4 of um, D&D, this is, you know, a little bit, this is quite interesting. Yeah, I, I have the books. I haven't played a lot of 4. I played a little 3 and a little 3.5 with Todd, like, forever ago. But it didn't. I, I, I didn't the, love it. Like I have the I three point five book. Um, never did three. Had three point five. We we played it down here a little bit in the cellar. You know, a few times here and there. And I went, wow, how really really easy to min max the crap out of your character. I think the only time I was um, played three point five wasn't even at a table. It was actually on a DDO or Dungeons Dragons Online. Yeah, which was a fine game when it first came out. It didn't get all the updates and the love that it really needed, but it was a, it was a good game. Right. And I think that's the, that's when I first saw 3.5 and even because I was still in the 2.5 error, it confused the shit out of me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's hard to, to adapt to. Uh, yeah. Hard overnight. To, I should say. Yeah, I mean, jump if, additions. If you, if you're coming in, you know, gradually, maybe that would be okay, but uh, I didn't like it. Yeah. You hopscotch around. They like said, I, I played 3.5, never played four. So I went from 2.5 to 3.5 to 5. I yeah. went from 2.5 to 5. <laughs> the most the most uh the most gaming I've done was probably with 2.5 and then and then 5th edition afterwards. I, I dabbled a little bit in the ones kind of that fell in between. And even a little bit of Pathfinder, but kind of felt like I was having an affair. Right. <laughs> you know, I want Well, I like Pathfinder. I like I like the way you know cuz it was it was well established and well rounded by then. And I think the the three point five four tried to emulate it and failed. It was a vice versa. Actually, Pathfinder yeah. was a more polished version of three point five. I think it was done on the open gaming license. I believe you're was right. Yeah. yeah, and they um, 
because I wasn't introduced to it till till afterwards. Like I said, I was I was so deeply mired in two and two point five that everything else just kind of went by and I just ignored everything. I think I'm not sure, but I think that's probably why there's all these new kind of rules for the open gaming license because Pathfinder became a thing and now Paizo's making money. <laughs> oh, they're making money hand over fist. Yeah, and I think yeah, I think the Path Pathfinder was was a little sharper. And three point five D and D, but we're digressing a little bit. We are. Okay. Let's let's get we back are. to the warlock. And All right, the whip the whip is cracked again. <laughs> let's talk about the best races for warlocks. So we can find warlocks on page one hundred five of the player's handbook. The player's handbook identifies charisma as being your highest score, followed by constitution. Charisma is your spellcasting ability, and constitution grants extra hit points if it's high enough uh, with a D eight per level. Having an extra Bump can't hurt. Wisdom would be your third ability stat out higher because your saving throws are tied to that ability. Um, let's look at some races that are very attractive options for building your warlock. Today we're looking at variant humans, uh, tiefling, half elves, and Asimar. All right, so the tiefling is almost a given, probably the best thematic choice for a warlock. Tieflings get a plus one to intelligence and a plus two to charisma. The Tiefling's Dark Vision, Resistance to Fire Damage, and their Infernal Legacy ability really add to the thematic draw of the Tiefling as a Warlock. Tieflings can be found on page 42 of the Player's Handbook. Uh, Variant Humans are a good choice. With a Variant Human, you get an ability score increase for any two abilities of your choice. You get an extra skill of your choice, and you get to select a feat right from the get-go. Humans are also a good choice without the Variant Human option. You get that ability score bump in each of your abilities, but no feat. Uh, Humans can be found on page 29 of the Player's Handbook. Half-Elves are a pretty good choice as well for just about anything in 5th edition. With Half-Elf, you get a Charisma score increase, and you get to choose another stat to bump up, so you can bump up Constitution or Wisdom. Half-Elves also get proficiency in two skills of your choice, which is always nice. Half-Elves can be found on page 38 of the Player's Handbook. And Asimar work really, really well. They get a charisma stat bump of two, which is going to help the spell casting, and a resistance to necrotic and radiant damage. It may seem strange to you at first thematically anyway. You choose an Asimar warlock, but they, like tieflings, are both celestial beings. And as such, it wouldn't be strange at all for them to seek to channel their power of a greater celestial being. You can find the Asimar on page 104 of Bolo's Guide to Monsters. I really dig the Asimar for... For, for a choice. The tiefling just seems like it's too easy. They work really, really well. But Oh, they work Asimar, well, but yeah, it's, it's kind of like do. it seems yeah. to be the go-to. But the Asimar, yeah, that, that, that'd be a, a little bit of a reach, but it'd be fun. I would probably just do it a little bit differently instead of, you know, I would definitely go with the charisma bump, but instead of constitution, depending on what style you're going to play of warlock, instead of constitution, I probably would go strength because I'd probably be going hexblade. Hexblade, yeah. yeah. So you're going yep. to manifest weapons. Yes, so I would go I, strength. Yeah. Hexblade is it, pretty cool. It is. I, I like It gives I you like best of both worlds, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think it does. You can um uh you're not as you're not as squishy if you build it right. Right. Um and you can get right up there. And it, it's just cool. I mean, manifesting a a weapon from the like the energies of the shadow fell. Yep. I mean how how badass is that? <laughs> right? Yeah, I you mean, can't get any better, you can, really. That, that yeah, you're, yeah. smacks of warlock, you know, that's... that's. Oh, gee, I'm going into town. Uh, feel free to frisk me. I have no weapons. Exactly. I'm right. not going to pay that weapons tax. I'm perfectly safe. He, 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 he. That's a, actually a nice segue into the, into the patrons. Um, <laughs> so the following patrons can be found on pages 108 and 109 of the Player's Handbook. This is the part of the warlock that I really dig. Yep. Um, the Arch Fay. I like the Arch Fay a lot. This is that's the one I went with with my first first character in Fifth Edition. Yeah, and I, I played think a that, warlock, and I went with the Arch Fay, and it worked amazingly well for me. I think it works really well with um with a half elf character. Mm-hmm. Um, though I I think you could have a really good time with a human character because that whole kind of Fay realm stuff is so outside of a human human's norm that it would be it would be very cool to bring bring a human into that sort of thing and uh that's one of the characters i'd like to see in my um my kind of like fantastical forest sort of 
sort of campaign that I'm, I'm, I'm working on writing, but <laughs> again, we have digressed. So, so this arch fay, this pact is made with either a Lord or lady of the fay, legendary creatures from the Seely and unseely court. Their motivations are sometimes whimsical and rarely understood by mortals. And I think that's probably why it's, it would be cool to put a human. Oh yeah. I can see that. I can see, I can see the one of the Seely going, Hey, that's a human. Get a load of this. Yeah, let, watch this. Let's play with them a little yep, bit. Yep. It it's a lot like the um like the stuff you get in fairy tales. Yeah. You know. This warlock could find themselves upon in an age old rivalry between fey creatures that predate the very existence of the world in which they live. You know, those those fey creatures kind of like playing the long game, you know? Oh, yeah. It's yep. uh you know, maybe having multiple pawns. Over the course of, of, of centuries. Yeah, three or four humans. Well, if it doesn't work out, eh, they don't live very long anyway. Yeah, it's it's like disposable minions yeah. almost. You know, the Bic lighters of the minion worlds. <laughs> Bic lighters. Okay, let's move on to the fiend. Uh, this pack is made with a fiend, a demonic creature from the lower planes of existence. Uh, these creatures are evil and corrupt, uh, desiring the destruction of all things, including you. They just don't tell you that right out in the get-go, but... Some people know it's coming, yeah. and the power they get is worth it. You, and you don't get that in the job interview, you know. That's no. and other duties as, <laughs> as, as, and as, other duties, as yes. given or granted, or however that wording is. There, um, I think a lot of that's what you 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 think of really when you think of a warlock patron. It immediately goes to like a fiend or or the next one we're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. You know, something inherently inherently wicked right so tell us about the next one well the next one is the great old one uh thank you hp lovecraft (laughs) Uh, this patron is a mysterious entity the nature of which is foreign to the fabric of your reality it may come from the far reaches of space or an even farther realm beyond your reality entirely it is a thing of legends an old god an ancient being with immense knowledge of the universe it's uh very Cthulhu, and I think blatantly Cthulhu mythos. Oh, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I won't say uh, a blatant ripoff, but damn close. But that's okay. It works for me. There's going to be a lot of tentacles involved. Or or possibly Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan, yeah. That is your, <laughs> that is your patron. Patron is Carl Sagan. He... Okay, the following patrons can be found on pages 54 and 55 of Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Let's start off with the Celestial. The Celestial is a powerful being of the upper planes. Such a connection may cause a character to radically change their beliefs and their behavior. One example that was given was an overwhelming desire to rid the world of undead, fiends, and or to protect the innocent. Uh, Such an individual knows deep down that they're destined to walk the celestial realm someday, but for now, they're here to protect the mortal realm from those creatures that intrude upon it. I see the Asimar warlock being being bound to a celestial patron. And it might be too easy, and it might be a given, but it'll still be cool. Yeah, and I can see him hanging out with, with, with a paladin. You know, this particular warlock kind of hanging out with a paladin, Kind of forming that bond of friendship on their shared zealotry. Now there's the dynamic duo. Yeah, <laughs> and and that's that's a that's a pretty pretty cool thing. And this one, this next one's smacks of Lou. Oh yeah, it's got Lou written all over it. And that yep. of course is the Hexblade. This is a pack made with the mysterious entity from the Shadow Fell. It's a sentient magic that manifests itself in the hands of the warlock as magical weapons. The most notable of these weapons, or perhaps even the most infamous, is the Black Razor. You can't get any better than that. I mean, just this class alone, that Hexblade, like I said, he's a, he does a little bit of everything. He can get up there and carve all over you and back away and just cast all over you. You know, it's a, it's a win-win for him. Has, I, has Lou written all over it, doesn't it? Yeah, yes, I, it does. I think we know. I think we know what his favorite one is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I definitely would be playing this one. I'm actually, like I said, in Baldur's Gate 3 right now, this is the class I'm actually playing. Now he's got to find a way to do the Hexblade Hexblade and the Genie at the same time. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's see what you, thought that crossed my mind. Oh see, my if you work, see if you can work up a genie blade or a hex genie. genie. Yeah. Oh, I, well, yeah, because all I would have to do is take the pack with blade. There you go. There you go. Yep. I'm all over that. Yep. I hope you're game mastering. Yeah. It probably will be. <laughs> okay. The following patrons can be found on pages 139 and 140 of the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. Let's start with the Undying. This patron has unlocked the secrets of everlasting life. It has lived for eons, and because of that, has ages of knowledge to share, including the secrets of life and death itself. This is the patron you choose if you want to learn secrets from the Arch Lich Vecna. It's a perfect opportunity for a character to take on Vecna as a patron, and for the Dungeon Master to weave his patron into the character's backstory as well as the overall campaign. Oh, it's too bad we don't have any episodes on liches or Vecna or even Vecna's artifacts, isn't oh, it? Oh, darn. It, it just leaves a giant empty hole, doesn't it? A gaping I, hole. I feel naked without those being talked about. I know. Perhaps, maybe, just maybe, we should reach, just maybe just kind of do a little, a little smidgen on it. A blurb. I, I would give it a little blurb. Yeah. Nothing yeah. more. Yeah. Just. Yeah. Go back and listen to them. Yes. They're there. They're there. <laughs> yeah. They're there. Yeah, we already did that. Okay, before we get into the backgrounds, let's take a break. If you don't mind. Already. We we'll have to go ready. upset Bill's wife again. <laughs> it's been a bumpy night. <laughs> let's not do that, please. <laughs> One of us is going to lose we, our genitals. We may, we may not come back. <laughs> and we're back. Yay. Boy, is she upset. I am sleeping downstairs tonight. I, yeah. I am not going upstairs. <laughs> Probably safer that way. So, Warlock backgrounds. Let's talk a little bit about these. Uh, the Warlock quick build in the player's handbook suggests that you pick the charlatan background, which I guess is okay. With charlatan, you get proficiencies in deception and sleight of hand, a disguise kit, and a forgery kit. I suppose this is a pretty good option, but to me it doesn't make any sense. You do get two skills, which are certainly beneficial, but I don't think the story fits well. No, nah, I, I don't. You know, I, you could make it work, I suppose, um, but it's a little, it's it's work to make it work. Uh, me, I yeah. like the acolyte. Uh, this fits well thematically, and perhaps your warlock, through the years and years of religious research, happened upon his otherworldly patron and entered into a pact this way. Uh, you get insight and religion in two languages of your choice. Uh, these languages can be rare languages like Infernal or Draconic, you get Shelter of the Faithful as a feature, and you get hearkened back to your days as a religious scholar. Uh, this happens to be the one that I went through when I built my, my first warlock, and no one could figure out. She, they knew she was a spellcaster, but they couldn't figure out what kind because she's casting different kinds of magic. I like how Acolyte fits in with the story. It's kind of got that, um, I don't know, Exorcist vibe. Yeah, you, you know, yeah, I where, can see that. Where... Maybe even if they weren't kind of stuck in a library researching, maybe they were, you know, an archaeologist researching out in the field or something, happened upon tomes, know, text, uh, yeah, you know, anything, glyphs, you know, and, and, and decided to decipher them. And lo and behold, you know, all those hieroglyphs revealed something to, you know, to that individual. And lo and behold, the patron be, you know, say, hey, you, you read that. I know you're there now. Yeah. I can the, do shit for you. The more intrigued they got behind this mythology of this, whatever it is, the more they, they, they tried to contact it. Maybe they found a a spell book or a summoning book or a clay tablet or something that tells you how to how to summon or correspond with whatever the creature is and you know, the rest is the rest is history. I just think it works a lot better than Thematically, the charlatan. Yeah, thematically, you know? yeah, charlatan. Uh, the, thematically, yeah, this this works very, very well. The the two skills you get with charlatan are really good skills and useful, and I think they kind of fit. But I don't know about forgery and the disguise kit. I I just don't see it. Like I said, it's a lot of work to make it work. Yeah, yeah I don't see it as well. All right. So what do you got next? I think sage is a good choice for the warlock too. I mean, pretty much any any wizard sorcerer, warlock type of character. Yeah, Sage to, works nice yeah, with. Any, any learned individual. Yeah. You know, you get the, the arcana and history skill, which I think like really works well with this type of character. And you do get the two languages of your choice. So you could pick something ancient, 
you know, that fits thematically with, with your character. But the Archon and History, I think, are the, are the big ones. Right. And that fits in with, with, with your, your backstory nicely because you can't go back to that researcher or acad- academian type of, type of uh, you know, background for your character. And it, it makes that whole how you contacted your, your patron. Well, how many times in comic books is the, the geeky, nerdy girl going through the tomes all of a sudden turns out to be the the super powerful hottie yeah yeah it's sage it, it's yeah a it, modern day comic book conversion but it's a sage yeah and it and it and it works well mm-hmm. for uh for backgrounds you, you know and i i think those backgrounds really need to fit in with your backstory it, well a lot of us develop our backstory first then look for the background that fits it yeah. but you can do the other way around whatever works for you as you're building yeah but I would say with our group and most of us, we we think of a character concept, and the background is is already a third built as we're going. Yeah, and really, uh, that's my preferred way to like character creation is, this is, is mine. come up with a backstory and then find the stuff that that fits in with it like easily. Right, this makes things easier. So with backgrounds, the thing I like to consider before I choose one of them is whether or not it fits thematically with my character. Uh, I'm looking for more than just what skills and tool proficiencies I get, I'm looking for whether or not I can plug that background into my character's backstory. The backstory is, to some extent, the background. It forms the foundation of what the character is, who they're going to be, and where they're going. So yeah. pretty much he's, there's no min-maxing. You're just going for RPG role-playing. Well, that I mean, you know me. Yeah, I, well, I, 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 I Iron Man my characters on a regular basis. I'll take whatever roles are out there. I will just go, all right, how, how many uh, backstories or how, how many backgrounds are there? Uh, six? Okay, I'll roll you six. And how many times has that worked for me? It, it has. But I just want to, I was just pointing out to all the listeners that yeah. there's more than just min-maxing and playing that way. Yeah, there's well, it's, also, right. it's a role-playing role game. Exactly. Right. And I think that's where the, the majority of the fun is, is, is in playing that role. It, it, it is. You know, it's nice to be effective. Um, it really is. But if you... If you're RPing, you know, and you really embrace that that complete character, it becomes more than just a bunch of numbers on a piece of paper. It becomes, it almost, I've had characters at my table that were um, very, very well portrayed, and they they became more than just a series of stats on a piece of paper. They were almost like three-dimensional. If it's done right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think a lot of the, the majority of the fun comes in that well i i, game like I have game. always purposely built in disadvantages faults foibles into my characters sometimes they've been major sometimes they've been minor a bunch of series of minor ones that have that, that you have to work around and for the role-playing aspect that's where it, it comes in fun yeah i and one of the other things too is and i've i've played with i've played with min maxers and, and really if that's your if that's your style of gameplay go for it you know yeah. embrace it enjoy it I'm not here to tell you how to play the game. That's that's up to the individual. But as game had, masters, referred to one of our earlier episodes where we told you how to deal with min maxers. Yes. Yep. Yes. Shameless plug. But I really enjoy as as a DM is is watching a character's growth throughout the entirety of the campaign. Yes. You know, watching watching characters that don't get along uh, form bonds of friendship. And characters uh, kind of grow as individuals, you know, kind of setting aside what what their differences are, what their their biases, their preconceived notions of another individual are, and growing as well. So that by the time they hit that 10, 11, 12, those top tier type things, they're they're a lot different than they were at level one. Well, and and to that point too, if you have a couple here that are have first started off as enemies or I'm not going to put up with this person. And next thing you know, they're, they're steadfast friends. And then two others do the same, two others do the same, you know, depending on how large your table is as these alliances build. And then one allied group allies with yet the next group. Now you have a working cohesive party and that's when it really becomes fun because they're working as a unit and it's a really big challenge for the game master to really be able big. To, to throw stuff out there that is going to stop what is becoming an indomitable force. You're dealing with 
heroic, legendary fighters and spellcasters that are renowned across the lands working together as a cohesive unit. Um, yeah, that band of orcs is not an issue anymore. No, we, we most need, things aren't. We need to find something bigger, badder. I need to start creating new stuff myself. And that's what I love to see is when the table finally gels and they just look at one another and your pal nods over to the, the spellcaster because he knows what the spellcaster is going to do. And the spellcaster looks over at the bard and the bard sits there and starts strumming on his, his lute. And the bard leans over and nods to the cleric who, you know, nods back and starts encanting. And there's not a word spoken. Everyone already knows what they're going to do. And then there's the game master going, oh, crap, here they go again. And now we're like in a totally different episode. Well, yeah. We so, are. That's, <laughs> so we, yeah, we digressed <laughs> again. Yeah. <laughs> back out to the warlock. Mouse. Yes. All right. So, Feats. 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 And, and not the kind you stand on. <laughs> All right. Let's start with the Spell Sniper. This is a great choice. Uh, this can be found on page 170 of the Player's Handbook. Uh, with this feat, you can double the range on any spell that requires you to make an attack roll. Uh, range spell attacks ignore half cover and three quarters cover, and you can learn one cantrip that requires an attack roll. These can be chosen from the Bard, Cleric, Druid, Sorcerer, Warlock, or Wizard Spell List. I like the spell sniper. Well, I do too. Oh, well, I mean, we know yeah. you do. Yeah. You've, you've played the crap out of it, and I've used it on a character or two as well. Um, it is fun, especially when these people start hiding from you. Well, yeah, you could almost, or try, yeah, try to, but then it's just that that range you get. The range is huge, especially on cantrips. Yes, I mean, you reach out to what the cantrip on, uh, like um, Elder's Blast. El- well, yeah, Elder's Blast is what one twenty. Yeah, somewhere around there. And now you reach out to 240, and it's like, no, I'm going to stand way back here and just do that one little, you know, D8, 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 D8. But by yep. the time they get to you, you've already burned off, you know, half their hit points. So What I like the most about Spell Sniper is if I'm playing a Warlock, I'm going to want to dip into Sorcery for a little bit because I think the two work well together. Well, that's where the Acolyte comes yep. in to start but, it off, but yeah. But you get the Distance Spell. Yeah. So when you use the distance spell, couple that with your spell sniper feet, you can be really effective. You mean yeah. the, uh, the meta magic? Yeah. 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 Quite a long range. It, it, yeah. In, in, insane ranges. Like I said, like we yeah. said, that uh, Elders Blast, and of course when you get the Elders Invocation, you kill them even before they even get to you. Yeah, you you spend one sorcery point and it doubles the range of the spell, but then you you look into spell sniper and that doubles the range of the spell so you double the doubled range of the spell and now you're i'm gonna sit on the mountaintop and look for their mage it's gonna be a long (laughs) charge yep to get to the warlock a long long charge i think that's really when they start to shine when you start adding those feats in there and maybe dip into other classes Mm -hmm. so let's talk about warcaster this is another one of my favorite like feats for anybody who casts spells with his feet, you have an advantage on constitution saving throws that make you maintain your concentration on a spell when you take damage. That's big. That's huge. That's huge. Yep. You can perform somatic components of spells even when you have weapons or a shield in one or both hands, and when hostile creatures' movement provokes an opportunity to attack from you, you can use your reaction to cast the spell at the creature rather than making an opportunity attack, and this works really well for, like, lose Hexblade Warlock. <laughs> Yep, you know, it does. It works. It works yep. nice. The uh, spell must have a casting time of one action and must target only one creature, though. Warcaster can be found on page one seventy of the player's handbook. Then you got the elemental adept. Uh, this is a pretty cool choice thematically for your warlock. You can find this on page one sixty six of the player's handbook. When you take this feat, you can choose one of the following damage types: acid, cold, fire, lightning. Lose favorite thunder. Thunderwave! <laughs> of course. <laughs> Any spells you cast ignore resistance to the damage of that chosen type. In addition, when you roll damage for a spell you cast that deals damage of that type, you can treat any one on a damage die as a two. You can also take this feat several times. Each time you have to pick a different type damage. There's not a lot of feats you get to pick repeatedly. So this one is pretty cool because then you can start. Like I, I think said, this is the only one, isn't it? Uh, I'm not it's sure. It's the one that comes to mind, but yes. I thought there was another one, but I'm, 
I, I'm, I'm brain cramping. Me too. I want to say there's another one, like, um, and I don't know the name off the top of my head, but it's it's a. Um, this is mostly because we're all old and we are drinking, yeah. as always. Well, I you know, we're constantly old. Yes, and apparently drinking. I think the other one is the. Can you do it with Marshall Adept? Oh, with different styles. Yeah, I don't think you could do that with that one. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking. <laughs> now, now I'm curious. Scott's though. curious. Now, oh I'm no, it just, it's just no. He, he broke out the book. There's no stopping him now. Did you find it? I, no, I, na, na, I think this na, is the only one I, currently. Na, 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 I I think you're right. Na, 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 yeah, I think you're right. I think that is the only one. That is my final answer. <laughs> He's going to call me at 2 o'clock in the morning. I found the other one. Yeah, or, or while I'm in the shower, it'll come to me. Yeah. <sighs> Every episode, you've got to mention the shower. Bill, I found it. Okay, so back on track once back again. Back on track. You can take it multiple times. Uh, just pick a different type damage each and every time. That works out well, especially as in higher levels when you can start rolling into you know your other spells. Now, if you have a signature uh, particular damage that you do, Lou Thunder Strike, um, anything Thunder. Let's get it right. Anything Thunder, yeah, the Thunder, anything. But you know you got Lightning added on there too, Lou. Yep. So that works well for you. And I don't see you doing Acid. No, no either. No. No, no, but you know, lightning, thunder, yeah, it, 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 each and every time. Acid's not dramatic enough. No, it's not. No, no. I like the thunder. That's why, I, that's why I have that, my cleric uh, that uh, follows Tempest. <laughs> I get the free thunder waves. Free thunder Well, they're not free, but. I you toss them around like that. He, he uses them freely. Like, very freely. All right, on to the next one. Uh, Lucky is a good choice no matter what your build is, whether it's a warlock, rogue, paladin, or some other class. You get three luck points. Whenever you make an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you could spend one luck point to roll an additional d20. You could choose to spend one of your luck points after you roll the die, but before the outcome is determined. That ain't bad. You get to choose which outcome on the d20s you use. You can also spend a luck point when an attack roll is made against you. Doing this allows you to roll a d20 and then choose whether the attack uses the attacker's roll or yours. If more than one creature spends a luck point to influence the outcome of the roll, the points cancel each other out. No additional dice are rolled. You regain your expended luck points when you finish a long rest. Lucky can be found on page 167 of the player's handbook. Now, see, that one would not work for me. Nor me. Especially with you know when you're dealing with damage. Well, maybe if you were playing a halfling warlock. Oh jeez! Because then it stacks with the halfling luck, and that's <laughs> yes. that's that's pretty good. I mean, you could get you get a whole lot of lucky done in a game <laughs> session. With I'm gonna have to think about that one too. Well, I'm I'm thinking it's like you let you roll your d twenty and pick which one, and you know how high my dice roll. Yeah, I mean, it, I have the option yeah. of a one or a two. That's usually, yeah. So for you, it worked yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I need just, all the lucky yeah, I can one, get. One, two, and three. Oh no, I'll take that. Me, I'm rolling eighteen, nineteen, and twenties, and like no, 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 no. But no, a halfling warlock. I think I can get behind that. Yeah, yeah, like an arch fay. I think I feel like definitely feel arch like, fay yep. halfling warlock yep. with the lucky feet. Yep, yep, definitely. I think he'd be pretty badass. His name would be Clover. I'm gonna I'm gonna create him tonight, <laughs> <laughs> or her, or, or her. her, yeah, Clover. Wow, I like it. There's racial feats, right? Yes, there We've are got racial feats. We shouldn't forget about those. Let's not. Racial feats are a really good option. Let's not. Let, let's not pass up on these. We, these are too too good to use. Infernal constitution and flames of the Lotus. Fle- Phlegathos. Phlegathos. It sounds like something you need a medication for. Uh, yeah, I looked at that and went, "Wow, can I actually yeah, say this on the uh, air?" I don't, I don't know where you've been, but you've got a bad case it's of the flames fl- of phlegathos. <laughs> so we need to get some antibiotics in you real quick. <laughs> there is no topical for that one. Uh, they're worth a look over if your warlock is a, a tiefling. Uh, Infernal Constitution grants you the resistance to cold and poison damage, advantage on saving throws against being poisoned, and gives you a plus one Constitution bump. Uh, you can find this on page 75 of Xanathar's Guide to Everything. 
You can uh, find Flames of Phlegathos on page 74 of Xanathar's Guide to Everything. This allows you to call on Hellfire to serve your commands. And what warlock wouldn't like that? Yeah, yeah. You can increase your intelligence or charisma score by one. When you roll fire damage for a spell you cast, you can re-roll any one of the fire damage dice, but you must use the new roll, even if it is another one. Whenever you cast a spell that deals fire damage, it causes flames to wreath around you until the end of your next turn. I think that's pretty sick. <laughs> it definitely yeah. paints a beautiful picture. It, it, it does, especially you know with your horned tiefling standing there looking looking all menacing and the whatnot. <laughs> So the flames don't harm you or your possessions, but they do shed a bright light out to 30 feet and a dim light for an additional 30 feet. While the flames are present, any creature within five feet of you that hits you with a melee attack takes 1d4 points of fire damage. That's pretty badass. That That is definitely thematical. That Yes, that's smacks that, of warlock. That, that smacks of oh, flames. And I would pick a different color. Green, purple, blue. Yeah. That definitely not red. Something like unnatural. Yes, for a flame. Something yeah. something odd. I think purple, 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 purple green, green. Yeah, yeah, or black, black. Well, nah, it's, it's hard be, to see at night. Yeah, well, it it's got to throw an awful lot of light, so the black doesn't really. I don't know. Have you ever seen a black flame? Um, no, but I have a black light because I'm really really old and have a lot of things that glow in the dark. <laughs> Lou shaking his head. <laughs> Yeah, he's see. he's ready to make reference to Gardens of the Galaxy. <laughs> yeah, the the black light. Let's the black light. Why don't you tell us about Elven accuracy? I will. We'll, we'll skip over this black light <laughs> su- subject. Elven accuracy can be found on page seventy four of Xanathar's Guide to Everything. This is a great choice if you happen to have an elf or a half elf warlock. Uh, this grants you the uncanny aim with attacks that rely on precision rather than brute force. Uh, you can. Rec- Increase your dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, or charisma score by one. Whenever you have advantage on an attack roll using any of the above, you can re-roll one of the dice once. So that's pretty cool. I love any feat that gives you a stat bump, too. I think that's well, like yeah. a twofer. Yeah, it, it feels like a twofer. Yeah, it's like buying something on sale. <laughs> you know, you you get twice as much of it, or you could buy like a, another thing. I think I, I really like those. Um, I like the racial feats just in general. I think they're they're pretty well, pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, there's a lot of times when you choose a race and you look at it and go, "Well, okay, yeah, it's really cool because I have horns or I have ears or something like that." But what else does it give me? Yeah, what does it do um, other than cosmetic stuff? Did you find it, Lou? Yeah, it was just uh, the Lightfoot halflings. They get a, a bump on Christmas by one, so. <laughs> You're on this whole. <laughs> yeah, Lou's over here he's building, on his, a, he's character. building a character. He's not paying any attention to what we're doing. He's got Clover half built already. Yep. I think he's rolling stats on his I'm gonna, laptop. I'm going to throw something out there. Crossbow expert. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Crossbow expert gives you short range capabilities. Like you could blast someone at short range. Takes that disadvantage away. Yep. And I think this is something that would have to be okayed by the DM and would be like a DM to DM kind of decision. You know, one DM may not be okay with it, another one might, you know, but are you gonna load gerbils instead of arrows? Uh no, I would okay, just, just I would just take defeat so that I could blast someone with with some of my ranged warlock attacks at short why, range why, without a Why did you look at Lou when you said someone? Yeah, I didn't like that. Is this harken back to the, the, the WOD when he decided he was going to find out how moral things were and shot you with a shotgun? I think, was it a shotgun? It was a pistol. It was a pistol. Same pistol, yeah. Same thing, a, still it was, hurt. Yeah, it did. Okay. It did. So I'm just wondering because, you know, it's like you're, you're, you you got great eye contact with me as you're describing. It's, and I'm going to shoot someone and you looked right over at Lou. So I was just curious. I, I digress. So I would, I would, I would say, and it may be a stretch, but crossbow expert might not be a bad feat. To risk it, I think in a homebrew world, like, a lot of like what we do, yeah, that may work. But it, you know, if you're doing rules as written, you know, it yeah, all rules as yeah. written, it probably wouldn't. And and the reason why is because it does mention, um, it does make it a point to mention the years of training you have with a crossbow, or extensive practice, or something like yeah, that yeah, with a crossbow. So I don't know, maybe maybe you had a hobby in your youth as a crossbow. 
marksman and it translates to your warlock spells but i think that would be a stretch and one of the other ones would be is it inspiring leader i think if 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 you're a uh if if you're a warlock you're gonna you're gonna want to have a high charisma you, you, yeah you need yeah. to have that high right charisma. so you're gonna be yep. kind of like the face guy you know for for the party or at least you should be yep um unless there's someone there with a higher charisma than you an inspiring leader may not be a may not be a bad one and i think sometimes people overlook that too because what my warlock would be a leader yeah why not they're charismatic mine was Mine yeah, was, yours definitely la, was. La, yeah. La, yeah, Lady Blackstar definitely was, even without the feet. She was just, I played her to the nines, and she was very imposing and 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 forceful, and no, we're going to do this. Why? Because I said so. But why? Ask me why again, you're going to find out why. Yeah, you might as well have taken an inspiring leader because you, you kind of <laughs> forced inspiration on us. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a it's it's a good it's a good feat to have. I think. If, it, if it yeah, is. I can see that one working. For, I can for see a high charisma character, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I can see that one working very well. So let's go into some multi class options. What do you think? I th- I th- I think I know what multi class I would want to play f- if I were to have a warlock, which someday I might if I ever get the opportunity to play. It just seems that once I have the opportunity to play, what do we have? A goddamn pandemic? It's like, come on, man. You have sucky timing. My my timing my timing has always been dreadful. <laughs> okay, so here are some things to think of when considering multi class options for your warlock character. If you ever get to play one, uh, charisma is a stat that warlocks use for spellcasting. They are proficient in land armor, but there are some patrons that provide additional armor proficiencies. All right, we talk a little bit about the warlock paladin multi class option in our paladins episode. If you haven't already listened to it. Please go check it out. Yeah, definitely go check it out. I had a good time doing that episode. <laughs> and who doesn't like Paladins, especially now in 5th edition? They're a hell of a lot better than they have been before. All right, a Warlock Sorcerer. This is a nice option, and I think it, it just works really well thematically, you know? Yes, yes. You get the Sorceress Origin and Meta Magic at 3rd level, and the Sorcerer... Sorcerer class has these supplementary spells that will really boost the effectiveness of your Warlock spells, such as Empowered Spell, Extended Spell, Quicken Spell, Subtle Spell, and Twin Spell. The Empowered Spell allows you to reroll damage dice. Extended Spell doubles a spell's duration if it lasts a minute or longer. With Quicken Spell, you, you can spend two sorcery points to change the casting time to one bonus action for, for casting. And that ain't bad at all. Uh, any bonus action is a good action. Yeah, yeah. When you cast a spell that targets only one creature and doesn't have a range of self, twin spell allows you to spend a number of sorcery points equal to the spell's level to target a second creature in range with the same spell. That's cool. I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, anytime you can double tap with the and same that, spell. And that works really well with the warlock, I think. It just it just the image pops into my mind of the you know, the warlock zapping someone mm-hmm. and then this guy who's coming up to flank the warlock, you know, gets blasted as well, not thinking it's gonna happen. <laughs> uh thematically, I think a warlock sorcerer multi class works really, really well. A sorcerer is a natural conduit for magical energies, but perhaps this individual is dissatisfied with the magic available to them. So they turn to a patron to kind of get some more power. Nothing like a supercharge. Yeah. Yeah. So role-playing warlocks. Throw some ideas out about that. I'm sure, well, Lou Lou already has a bundle of ideas here. I can see the wheels turning. Oh, don't interrupt him. He's halfway through the, uh, the, Clover the over there. The gerbil on the wheel is working <laughs> overtime. Those little legs are moving. What was that? I'm sorry. I was uh, writing some stuff down. <laughs> like I said, I mean, Lou's building his uh, warlock now as we speak. Um, I already played one. I really loved the warlock. Uh, you, at, at first glance, it's one of those, boy, that's kind of an underpowered. And then you kind of start reading through the patrons, and then you look at some of the other abilities that are back there, and then it's like, wow, these kind of uh, add together to be a – a formidable character. And like I said, I took the Acolyte right off the bat. I think I would definitely go with either an Acolyte or a Sage background, but I I would want that. I would want that researcher. I would want that person who had no desire whatsoever to do anything other than be an academic 
go out there and discover a few things, kind of get caught get up more. Yeah, get caught up, get more and more intrigued um, by, you know, mention of an entity in some ancient. Well, it's it, st- it starts off with the quest for knowledge, and next thing you know, it transitions yeah. to the quest for power. I think um, now what you use with that power, whether you go down the rabbit hole and and get all dark or. You you know try to step above that and say no I'm going to use this power for good that depends on the the background the player the character uh, but that that transition that's that's your background that's your story yeah. right there is that when that that switch was flipped and you've gone from you know the quest for knowledge to all of a sudden it, it starts creeping over to the quest for power because uh, knowledge is power and then power is power yeah all right. I think someone who experienced a situation where they had no power at all yeah. to execute change or protect a, a loved one, and because of that, they they lost they lost someone uh, dear to them, so they turned to an otherworldly entity. You know, maybe not having the um, the physical presence to be a warrior, a paladin, or a ranger, or the intelligence or time to be a wizard and certainly not having the raw ability to be a sorcerer, they turn to another another means of getting that power. Or that power recognizes your desires yeah. and and through their own, you know, de- their own desires and, and what game they're playing saying, I have something for you. So I, I think when role playing your your warlock, you know, kind of that that slow intoxication, right, with the power that they get, especially if they were, like, disempowered before, Mm -hmm. you know, where they didn't have, they didn't have a lot going for them. Um, And now suddenly they have power, you know, like, they get that, that Eldritch, um, Eldritch Blast cantrip, right? So they start playing around with that. Look at what I can do. And then, and then they, they, they kind of get that, that little extra boost, you know, with the agonizing blast, well, yeah, well, it, it'd be a disservice to not go into the invocations. I mean, there's a lot of them to choose from. Yeah, they make the warlock a very attractive class when you when you look at those. Yeah, you've you've taken your your warlock, but if your warlock is skittering on the dark side or wants to be out there in the light for all to see and be an inspiration, there's something in the invocations for everyone. Yeah, I I like the chains of Carceri, you know, and in, in, in this uh of course you have you have to be fifteenth level to play around with this, but you can cast hold monster at will. Um targeting a celestial fiend or or an elemental. And I, I see that especially with role playing your warlock right where it's maybe there's some resentment for that entity that's kind of funneling power to them because it's got some control because nothing is free right so every opportunity i get i'm going to torment one of these since i i have no power really against my uh my patron i'm going to i'm going to take that that kind of anger out on on whatever fiend or celestial or Elemental, I happen to to get in those chains, you know, and 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 toy with them a little bit, and I and I see a lot of these lending to kind of like that dark side of 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 a warlock, or binding the fiends because you're trying to be a glowing example of what warlocks are and not what everyone thinks they are. Right, right, All right. See, one of my faves um, is the arm armor of shadows. Now, this lets you cast mage armor on yourself at will without spending a slot that that lasts for eight hours. So that's pretty nice when you can all of a sudden bump your AC up and protect yourself without having any armor on. And it's gotta be more than just mage armor, right? You just can't say it. Like I, I cast mage armor, right? No, I'm I'm wreathed in in like this armor of shadows. Yeah. So, you You know, know, there's always this, you have trouble focusing. There's always this, it always looks like your clothes are slowly cascading off of you, but never seem to go anywhere or it swirls at your feet. I mean, you could pick whatever you want, but this is one that I've used for my character and it works amazingly well. So my favorite um, would be with the hex blade would be devil's sight. So I can cast darkness in an area 
because I can see in magical darkness and non-magical darkness. So I can go in there into my own darkness spell and not have any disadvantage while attacking the guy with my blades. I I really dig the beguiling influence. Um, that just that, that, that it's small, but it grants you dis, uh, proficiency in deception and persuasion. And I just I just see a, a warlock is kind of like a, a somewhat vampiric kind of character, you know, where they're <laughs> going to they'll be that person that shows up at the dinner party, and they may not be the most attractive person there, but they are the one that people are most attracted to. to. Yeah, with that charisma of eighteen, let's say. Uh, yeah, yeah of course. right, 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 and and just being really, really good. At spinning a yarn and getting people to believe, you know, the tale that they're telling and being able to influence people and kind of twist that is a good one. Their their opinions and their thoughts, you know, being able to sow deception amongst another group of individuals. There you go. You know, very subtly. Mm-hmm. Another one I like to use is Mask of Many Faces. Now this one's fun. It it gives you basically disguise disguise self. At will, uh, it now I've used this one again, yep. where the character would just change his face, and you walk around the corner, you're being chased by someone, or you need to get into somewheres. You can mimic somewhere someone else, or just change into a different person. Um, I've I've actually used this to get away from the city guard when they thought I was the one responsible for something and was not, but they decided to chase me. Uh, just ducked around the corner. Uh, changed myself at will, threw myself to the ground going, ow, 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 he went that way, he went that way. And they went charging the other way. Get up, walk around the corner, and you're off scot-free. This one's a great way of getting yourself out of trouble, especially if you're – I've always seen the warlocks as kind of like the the red-headed stepchild, you know, the bastard. Not not the real spell casters, and they're looked down upon. Well, that's because they're in that gray area. Right. They're they're usually in that gray area. So they're not looked at favorably, even when they've done nothing wrong. Sometimes you just need to get away. And this is a good way to just get away. Yeah, I I like that Thirsting Blade uh, invocation as well. Um, And that gives you that second attack with your your packed weapon. And, and, And I think... Especially with with all these invocations, you know, go, add some flavor to them. You know, just just don't say I attack twice. No, I have my packed weapon, and I attack with my sword. But on my second attack, maybe it's like a a, a sigh or a, a, a sickle, a sickle, a sickle something. or you know, a a barbed chain or, or or something. You know, that second go around. But you know, add some flavor to it. Make it cool. Yeah, yeah. Throw some, give your character some character. Yeah, throw some Mrs. <laughs> Dash on that plain chicken <laughs> breast, you know? <laughs> Just stay away from the salt. Yeah. <clears throat> the other one I used um, is uh, One with Shadows. I Or One with Shadows, right. Um, yeah, One with Shadows. Duh, I'm brain cramping here. Fifth level, it works. Um, if you're in dim light, or any darkness, you can use your action to become virtually in, invisible until you move. Now, this lends to the thematic, you know, stepping out of the the shadows unexpectedly with that word of caution or advice or, I don't know what we're going to do. Well, this is what I would do. It's about time well, you've arrived. Yeah. I've been where, waiting for you. Where the hell did you come from? You know, that kind of, it, 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 it lends to that kind of, you know, or just fading back into the, the nothing and, and then you use this invocation. It's like, he just backed up into nothing and disappeared. Oh, crap. Or just a set of eyes peering at you, you know, through the darkness when, when the warlock finally decides that it wants to make itself known. Yeah, so you can have a lot of fun with this one, you know, thematically. Uh, or, you know, you go that roguish touch. And there's, there's, I wouldn't say tons, but there's there's plenty of these to kind of play around with, you know, and and uh, use with your warlock character from, you know, from very early on in its leveling all the way up to, you know, those those top tier levels. Do you do you remember the Thundercats? Who doesn't remember the Thundercats? Yeah, you know, when when we were looking into this doing the research on this episode, it occurred to me 
Mumra, Mumra is a warlock. Mumra yep. is a warlock. Yeah. You know, he was calling upon ancient spirits of evil, maybe the undying. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. And uh, probably. Most definitely. Probably was cavorting with Vecna. Thundercats, <laughs> ho! Yep. That's what that I remember. Mumra. Yep. It just occurred to me. That's a good That's a good occurrence. But it, but, but it, it uh, I'll give it to you. It's it fits. Man. It fits. Yeah. Yep. So let's, uh, let's boil it down. There's a lot you can do with your warlock. Dig into the book. Take a good, good, hard look at the invocations, the backgrounds, the patrons. The variety and possibilities are absolutely endless. So make a warlock. Have fun. Cast spells. Be creepy. And that's this week's episode, our class review of the warlock. Look for more DM quick tips, our new segment, A Monster in a Minutes, and the all-new mini-episodes for this month. Halloween is in October. And that means all our Dungeon Masters Dojo content in October is Halloween themed. See you next time in the dojo. That's going to conclude this episode. Thanks for tuning in and listening. Please subscribe to the podcast for more great content. If you'd like to hear a particular topic, you can reach us out on Facebook at the Dungeon Masters Dojo. Or you can drop us an email at the Dungeon Masters Dojo at gmail.com. Thank you and have a good day.